Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome back to ACNS webinars. The speaker for the first session of today is our honorable guest from Japan, Professor Hitoshi Fukuda. Professor Fukuda is an associate professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at the Kochi University Hospital, Kochi, Japan. He was a previous fellow of the Wale Cornell Medical College, Kalbis Laboratory, New York, and he is a hybrid trained neurosurgeon. And his research interests are focused upon stroke and cerebrovascular diseases. He was the recipient of the European Stroke Research Foundation Award in Athens in 2018. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars, and today he will be talking about hybrid surgery and skull based techniques to treat complex cerebral aneurysms. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from India, Professor Srinivasan Paramashivam. He is a consultant neurosurgeon and endovascular surgeon at the Apollo Hospitals, Chennai. He was a formal endovascular neurosurgeon at the Mount Sinai Hospital, USA, and he specializes in the management of complex cerebrovascular diseases and stroke. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars, and today we will be talking about the history of evolution of endovascular stroke treatment in the last two decades. The chair for the first session of today is a distinguished faculty from the USA, Dr. Mohsin Nuri. Dr. Nuri is the Director of Cerebrovascular and Interventional Neurosurgery at the Jamaica Hospitals, New York, USA. He is a hybrid trained neurosurgeon who specializes in the treatment of stroke and cerebrovascular diseases. He was a former fellow at the Fujita Health University, Japan, and we are extremely grateful to him for accepting an invitation to chair the session of Professor Hitoshi Fukuda. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is an honored guest from Japan, Professor Watara Surata. Professor Surata is the Chief of Department of Endovascular Neurosurgery in the Thoranaman Hospital, Tokyo, Japan. He is the Director of the Japanese Society for Neuroendovascular Therapy and he specializes in the management of cerebrovascular disease and stroke. He is a noted author with several publications in various internationally reputed journals. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Paramashivam. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers, chairs and the wonderful audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China and we are extremely grateful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Dr. Li Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today and with that introduction I would like to hand over this podium to our first chair, Dr. Mohsin Nuri. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Raja, for the kind introduction and the, for organizing these meetings over the last couple of months. Yeah. Um, dear colleagues, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you anywhere in the world you are watching us from. It's with uh, greatest art and utmost pleasure to uh, join ACNS family once again. Um, as a uh, very well introduced by Dr. Raja. The first topic uh, of uh, presentation discussion today is about hybrid treatment of the aneurysm and hybrid strategies to treat them. Um, over the last uh, couple of years, so many devices, like in, endovascular devices, such as stents, coils, flow diverters, intersacular devices, have been introduced to the market. And um, this simply shows that we're still struggling with treating uh, and finding a good and reliable endovascular um, uh, strategy to treat the aneurysms, especially the wide neck and complex aneurysms. Um, so um, this multiplicity and diversity of the newly introduced devices per se shows that the outcome is not desirable still. So um, the idea of combining the two worlds, bridging the world of cerebrovascular with endovascular to optimize the outcome is a brilliant idea. This has come up in recent years again. We have uh, the data is still scarce. We haven't uh, got like so many studies on that, but the are centers and people who are working on that to uh, combine the two strategies. These two strategies have been in place as like um, uh, a backup plan, uh, like a rescue strategy for years. For example, you go and clip an aneurysm, you have some remnant, then you coil it, or you coil an aneurysm, you have recurrence, you clip it. These are, these are not called hybrid strategies or hybrid procedures. Hybrid procedures means that previously and intentionally you go there to treat the aneurysm with combination of open vascular and endovascular together. And that's a brilliant idea to uh, get the best of both worlds to the benefit of our patients. 
I'm very excited today to hear the experience of a very well-trained and skillful neurosurgeon, Dr. Fukuda from Koichi University in Japan um, to uh, hear about his experience and uh, the challenges he has faced in treating these aneurysms with hybrid techniques. Um, I think uh, we could have a very good discussion uh, after his presentation. I don't want to take time anymore. Uh, Fukuda-sensei, dozo onegaishimasu. Uh, Dr. Nori, thank you for your uh, nice uh, introduction uh, in Japanese. <laughs> well, thank you for uh, Chairman Dr. Nori. Uh, I am Dr. Hitoshi Fukuda from uh, Kochi Medical School Hospital, Japan. Today, I'm going to talk about hybrid surgery and skull-based technique to treat complex cerebral aneurysms. Let's get started. Uh, first of all, uh, let me introduce my workplace, Kochi, Japan. Uh, this is Japan map, and uh, Kochi is located southern west of Japan. So the climate is co of Kochi is uh, warm and humid. Uh, this is my favorite scenery in Kochi with a beautiful river and a bridge. This bridge uh, looks strange. This is called Chinkabashi Bridge in Japanese. Uh, this bridge is designed to be underwater uh, during the flood and then reappears uh, without being broken after the flood. Uh, so uh, this is a nice bridge. The agriculture and the nature is very, very excellent in, in Kochi. Uh, rice and vegetables are yummy. Uh, we also love uh, this fish uh, called katsuo uh, in Japanese and bonito in English. Uh, this fish looks like tuna, but has a different taste. Uh, Kochi people are always happy, kind, and generous. So you guys are always welcome to Kochi's, and then I will show you around. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, two topics, uh, direct endovascular hybrid strategy for complex aneurysms, and then uh, skull-based technique as assist for complex aneurysm surgery. Uh, <coughs> My hybrid strategy does not necessarily mean what the Dr. Nori introduced. Sometimes it is kind of a uh, intentional uh, combination, but sometimes not intentional. But anyway, I'll talk about these topics uh, with my case presentations. So what the uh, hybrid neurosurgery for cerebral aneurysms means? Uh, Actually, cerebrovascular uh, hybrid neurosurgeon is defined as a surgeon uh, who has been trained for both uh, coiling and clipping. Uh, for some reasons, uh, in Japan, uh, there are so many uh, uh, cerebrovascular hybrid neurosurgeons, and I am the one. When I started working as a hybrid neurosurgeon, uh, I was working on a simple cases, so... I was always wondering uh, what's the best choice to treat this aneurysm, coil or grip. However, as I carried out, uh, carried on my uh, career as a hybrid neurosurgeon, I have experienced uh, more complex cases, which may require a simultaneous combination of coil and grip in hybrid OR or a staged strategy uh, using both uh, procedures. So I will uh, show you uh, my experiences. Uh, this is a hybrid OR case. Uh, this is a 45-year-old woman uh, who presented uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage WFNS grade 1. This free MRI imaging shows the thin subarachnoid clot uh, at her left temporal lobe. And her, her angiogram shows uh, irregular uh, dilatation of the supracrinoid to carotidosiphon I, left ICA together with uh, narrowing of the ICA up to the orifice of the anterior choroidal artery. So because this is a so-called pearl and string sign, we diagnose this one as a dissecting aneurysm of the supracrinoid to carotidosiphon ICA involving the orifice of the ophthalmic artery. 
So the location of the aneurysm is uh, here uh, in this picture. Uh, in this case, uh, we decided to do the parent artery occlusion strategy with a uh, high flow bypass. That means external carotid artery, radial artery graft, middle cerebral artery bypass. However, even when uh, we can compensate the cortical blood flow by this nice bypass, what should we do to safely and completely occlude this aneurysm? Uh, let me talk about the surgical trapping with aneurysmal clips. Uh, first, uh, we're going to consider intracranial trapping of this aneurysm. Probably, uh, we can put the aneurysmal clip at the distal end of the aneurysm, uh, which is also just proximal to the PCOM artery, so that the uh, <clears throat> backflow from the high flow bypass can preserve the, this uh, blood flow to anterior colloidal and PCOM. However, putting the proximal clip, uh, clip intracranially looks very challenging because this aneurysm extends extracranially. So how about the cranial cervical trapping of this aneurysm? Uh, in this case, uh, we'll uh, put the aneurysm, aneurysm clip on or the ligate, uh, the cervical ICA. However, by doing so, the reflux uh, from the ophthalmic artery may uh, remains or potential collateral flow from the external carotid system, such as inf inferior lateral trunk and meningo hypophysial trunk may open. So we cannot completely uh, exclude the aneurysm uh, from the circulation uh, immediately. Uh, next strategy is internal trapping with coils. If we can put the coil mass like that, uh, we can completely occlude the annulus. <clears throat> However, when we do this internal trapping with coils, uh, we have to think about how we control and stabilize the distal end of the coil mass. If this is a true annulus with a significant space in the annulus sac, uh, we can uh, start coiling uh, by uh, placing the initial coils in the aneurysm, and then the following coils uh, can be anchored by initial coils and stabilized, so it's okay. However, this is a dissecting aneurysm case, so I don't want to put the initial coils in the, this fragile uh, shoot lumen of this dissection. <coughs> So we have to start coiling from the normal or parent artery, which may uh, cause the distal migration of this uh, of the initial coils to PCOM and anterior colloidal, or uh, this may cause the distal emboli uh, while we are str struggling to stabilize uh, these initial coils. So uh, what did we do? So I performed the, this clip anchored coil embolization strategy. This is a schematic imaging of this operation. After the hybrid high flow bypass is done, as the carotid system, we put the clip uh, on the ICA just proximal to the PCOM artery, and then uh, put the uh, micro catheter and uh, occlude the ICA around here. This clip worked as an anchor uh, for these coils uh, to, to stabilize, as well as uh, blocks uh, the potential distal uh, emboli uh, from this coil mass. This is our operation video. When we, we do the high flow bypass, we also set the low flow bypass, uh, that's STA M4 bypass. M2 portion of the M CA is exposed in the Serbian fissure, and this is M4. STM4 bypass is okay. Then the radial artery graft was put through uh, from cervical portion to the cranial portion. 
And the distal end of the uh, radial geograft was the last most uh, with M2 portion. The proximal end of the graft is also a nast most with uh, external carotid artery. And this bypass is okay. Uh, this is carotid, internal carotid artery and you can see the aneurysmal sac behind the ICA as well as tiny PCOM. Then I put the clip on the ICA just proximal to the PCOM. PCOM is okay. Then this is a hybrid wall. So we puncture the carotid artery and uh, put the guiding catheter in the ICA. And then the start coiling at the uh, clip anchored portion. Because it is anchored by uh, the clip, it is easy uh, to embolize uh, the supracrinoid to carotid siphon to the cavernous portion of the ICA and the embolization is completed. The post-operative course of this patient was excellent. She didn't suffer from any ischemic complications. You can see the clip and coil mass in this CT angel. MR angel shows nice patency of the high flow bypass and the PCOM artery is still patent. Let me move to the second case. This is also the hybrid OR case. This is a 68 year old man presenting acute left oculomotor palsy. Free MRI shows no subarachnoid clot, but his CT angiogram shows left uh, PCOM aneurysm, uh, the size of which is uh, 7 millimeter. Uh, this is an uh, operative view of front temporal craniotomy for this aneurysm. When you see the PCOM aneurysms with oculomotor palsy, 34 to 56% uh, of this aneurysm had been already ruptured or uh, will rupture shortly. So we have to do some emergent operation for this aneurysm. In terms of the improving rate of ochromotor palsy, uh, surgical clipping is a little superior uh, to the endovascular coiling uh, because the surgical clipping can reduce the mass effect immediately. So we <laughs> decided to do the emergent surgical clipping for this aneurysm. So this is a surgical clipping for impending rupture of left PCOM aneurysm. First, we expose the cervical ICA, and then we perform the left front temporal craniotomy. However, just after the craniotomy, his ECG shows a ventricular tachycardia due to atypical angina. Fortunately, his ECG recovered uh, shortly, but the anesthesiologist and the uh, cardiologist recommended to terminate operation or switch to less invasive treatment. So what should we do next? Should we terminate operation? However, uh, by doing so, the risk of aneurysmal rupture remains. Should we switch to endovascular embolization? But the endovascular procedure requires a heparinization uh, there's a risk of operation site bleeding, post-operative e uh, epidural hematoma, for example. So what we did is a uh, hemostasis coiling hemostasis strategy uh, using hybrid OR. First, uh, we stopped the bleeding very carefully and then the close, uh, close the skin before heparinization. And then we transferred the patient to the hybrid OR. In hybrid wall, we perform the coil embolization of this aneurysm as a usual manner with heparinization. After that, on the uh, OR table, uh, we open the skin again and then the <coughs> stop the uh, bleeding uh, again carefully and carefully. Uh, before the patient woke up from anesthesia, 
the city-like imaging、uh, is available in the hybrid world. So we got the city-like image to、uh, confirm complete hemostasis. So I want to, I would say,、uh, hybrid world is also good for、uh, troubleshooting of cerebral vascular surgery. Let me move to staged hybrid surgery,、uh, first case. This is a 82 year old woman with Parkinsonism, rheumatoid arthritis, presenting with WFNS grade one subarachnoid hemorrhage. So this is a acute subarachnoid hemorrhage of the、uh, small, old, fragile woman.、Uh, CD scan shows subarachnoid clot and she had an ACOM annu ruptured ACOM aneurysm. This CT angio shows the catheter access is good、uh, to the anus, but the problem was it is impossible to obtain the optimal working angle for embolization.、Uh, this is the optimal angle、uh, where the、uh, parent artery and the animal neck、uh, are well separated, but as this、uh, posture indicator shows,、uh, it is impossible to obtain this flat panel angle. However, in this case,、uh, we thought、uh, less invasiveness is the most important、uh, to treat this、uh, small old fragile lady. So we decided to do the emergent endovascular coiling under suboptimal working angle. Uh, because this is、uh, performed under suboptimal working angle,、uh, our goal of this treatment is、uh, occlude the、uh, rupture point, but、uh, we don't want to st、uh, stick to the complete occlusion of the aneurysm. So, as a result, the, we successfully、uh, occluded the anterior part.、Uh, this is the rupture point of the aneurysm. But the posterior part of the aneurysm remained. Even after in less invasive endovascular embolization, the postoperative cause of this fragile lady、uh, was actually eventful.、Uh, she first suffered、uh, urinary tract infection and we gave her an antibiotics. However, because of this antibiotics, she next suffered clostridium difficile colitis. Because of these two infections,、uh, she became very inactive and she felt difficulty walking,、uh, which is a disuse syndrome. So we sent her to the rehab、uh, for two months.、Uh, after the two months of rehabilitation,、uh, she became, she recovered as active as before. So we plan to elective surgical clipping for the remaining aneurysm. We perform the clipping、uh, through the anterior interhemispheric approach. After the craniotomy,、uh, this is the bilateral、uh, A2 portion of the、uh, anterior cerebral artery. The interhemispheric fissure was dissected very carefully、uh, and then completely、uh, opened. This is an ACOM complex、uh, with a cold aneurysm. We are now checking the neck. And the ICG shows、uh, there's a coil, but some residual part of this aneurysm behind the coil.、Uh, temporary clip is applied. We are now checking the, the, there's a residual neck behind the coil mass. I use a fenestrated clip to pass the coil mass and to completely occlude the、uh, neck behind the coil. Clipping is complete. And ICA looks good. ICG looks good. So, in summary, the, this is a staged coiling and clipping strategy for ruptured ACOM aneurysm、uh, of the old patient. So, in the acute stage,、uh, 
less invasive emergent partial coronary coiling is performed. And then the, in the chronic stage, when the patient is, uh, patient situation is good, uh, we perform the invasive elective complete clipping for the, uh, of the aneurysm. And uh, post-operative angiogram shows complete uh, obliteration of the aneurysm. Let me move to the staged hybrid surgery case two. This is a 43-year-old man presenting with seizure, subarachnoid hemorrhage WFNS grade two. CT scan shows uh, his right side uh, isodense uh, subarachnoid clot. And she ha uh, he had a large uh, right PCOM aneurysm with fetal PCOM, where his uh, PCA territory uh, is mainly supplied by uh, through PCOM. Uh, according to this, uh, his uh, right uh, P1 is hypoplastic. First, uh, we uh, embolized this aneurysm uh, with a simple technique, and the result looks very good. Uh, however, after the coiling in four months, uh, the aneurysm recurred. And uh, for this recurrence, uh, we re-embolize this aneurysm uh, with the assist uh, of the stent uh, in PCOM. However, in six months from the second uh, embolization, the aneurysm uh, recurred again. During this period, uh, the aneurysm size uh, got bigger uh, from 11 millimeter to 16 millimeter. So this is not a simple or coil compaction but this is a recurrence uh, associated with aneurysmal regrowth. So what should we do next? Should we repeat coil embolization? However, this type of recurrence is caused by the he direct hemodynamic stress to the aneurysmal neck. So the same thing is going to happen. Uh, aneurysm will keep growing. Uh, should we do the surgical clipping? However, as you can see here, the most of the aneurysmal sac is already packed with a, a big coil mass. So the clipping uh, is associated with the risk of coil migration or incomplete occlusion. We could uh, remove the uh, uh, coil, but it is also risky. In this situation, uh, we can think of uh, sidewall type conversion strategy to this aneurysm. In this, uh, in this strategy, uh, we want to reduce uh, hemodynamic direct stress to the neck uh, by converting this terminal type PCOM aneurysm to sidewall type PCOM aneurysm by occluding the PCOM artery combined with PCA bypass. This is a uh, operation video. Uh, the skin incision is like that. This is right side. Uh, right temporal craniotomy. Uh, and to get a nice operative view of the uh, PCA, we partially drill the uh, petrosal bone. After the drilling of the petrol spoon, uh, superficial temporal artery was uh, harvested up to 10 centimeter. After the dura is open, this is the tentorial edge and trochlear nerve ambient cistern here. This is a PCA main trunk, but it was too deep in this case. So I selected the posterior temporal artery, a branch of PCA uh, as a recipient like this. Uh, SDA PCA bypass was performed uh, nicely and slowly. Uh, with 10 or nylon. Uh, 
Uh, this is the other side of the stitch. Nicely and steady. And the bypass is completed. Uh, STA is opened. The bypass looks good. Seven days after the, this bypass, uh, coil embolization uh, of the aneurysm was performed. Uh, before the coiling of the aneurysm, we confirmed the PCA bypass is okay. And then the, we uh, embolized the aneurysm as well as the orifice of PCOM. Unfortunately, at the end of the uh, embolization, the PCOM flow uh, is, uh, is a little bit uh, <coughs> recanalized. Uh, however, as you can see, this emerged image of internal cultural and external cultural angiogram, most of the PCA territory flow uh, is supplied by this bypass, and the PCOM flow is uh, very faint. His post-operative course was very good. Uh, before the bypass surgery, this aneurysm uh, continued to grow uh, from 11 millimeter to 17 millimeter uh, for 12 months. But uh, for next 12 months after the bypass, the size of the aneurysm was stable uh, and he's uh, doing well even now. Let me talk about treatment options for recurrent aneurysms after coiling. There are two, two possible patterns of uh, recurrence uh, of coil, previously coiled aneurysms. The first one is coil compaction. Uh, in this pattern, uh, coil mass shrinks. Uh, however, the overall size of the aneurysm doesn't change. For this pattern, re-embolization of the aneurysm is safe and effective. Uh, in most cases, the aneurysm uh, cures. Uh, however, in this aneurysm regrowth pattern, uh, the hemodynamic stress directly to the neck uh, caused the distal, uh, distal uh, migration of this coil mass, and then the overall uh, aneur aneurysm size uh, get bigger. In such a case, we have to reduce uh, this hemodynamic stress and the best uh, procedure is clipping. However, uh, if the, this aneurysm is unclippable for some reason, flow alteration strategy uh, is an alter alternative. Actually, the flow alteration strategy for intractable aneurysms uh, has been already reported. Uh, the most common uh, is a flow diverter, uh, where the partially coiled aneurysm uh, can cure uh, by this flow diverter effect. Parent artery straightening strategy uh, is also reported, where uh, closed cell stent uh, is inserted uh, to uh, make the parent artery straight uh, to prevent uh, aneurysm recurrence uh, of the co uh, cold aneurysm. Bypass assisted sidewall conversion strategy is also reported uh, to treat uh, vagular bifurcation uh, giant thrombosed aneurysm. Okay, for the rest of my time, uh, let me show you some skull-based technique for complex aneurysms. Uh, in general, uh, there are three uh, skull-based techniques for uh, complex aneurysms. Anterior crinoidectomy for ICA aneurysm, transpetrosal approach for upper posterior circulation aneurysm, and transcondylar fossa approach for lower posterior circulation aneurysms. Actually, I used to use uh, anterior crinoidectomy a lot for paracrinoid aneurysms. However, after introduction of stent assistant coiling and flow diverters, uh, more and more paracrinoid aneurysms have been treated with endovascular treatment. 
So currently, uh, I only use uh, clipping with anterior crinoidectomy for the aneurysm uh, presenting uh, acute uh, neuropathy. Uh, this is a, a paracrinoid uh, aneurysm case uh, presenting acute optic neuropathy. Uh, in this case, uh, I didn't use endovascular. Uh, I uh, removed the anterior crinoid process, uh, mobilized the optic nerve gently, and uh, clipped the aneurysm. This is a, a large epicom aneurysm presenting uh, acute oculomotor palsy. But because this aneurysm is locate, located very low uh, along the skull base, I removed the anterior crinoid process and exposed the uh, proximal neck of the aneurysm and clipped it. Transpetrosal approach is good for upper posterior circulation aneurysm. And this approach is, of course, uh, very useful to directly manipulate the challenging aneurysm. However, I want to emphasize the validity of this approach for the challenging, uh, deep challenging bypass surgery to superior cerebral or posterior cerebral arteries. Uh, this patient uh, suffers the hemodynamic ischemia of the posterior circulation uh, because of uh, dissection of the basilar artery. In this case, uh, PTA is uh, dangerous. So uh, I <coughs> opened the temporal bone, uh, just cut the uh, tentorium, and then the bypass uh, to the SCA, and the patient is doing very well. But when I want to the bypass to the PCA, uh, we have to do some petrosectomy. Uh, I usually use uh, this lateral partial petrosectomy uh, for the bypass to the PCA, uh, as I showed you before. However, in some cases, uh, we have to do the high flow bypass to the posterior circulation by using radial artery graft. Uh, this is a, a giant uh, thrombosed aneurysm of the vertebral artery compressing medulla oblongata. Uh, contralateral vertebral artery is hypoplastic. Uh, in such a case, uh, to make a, a wider space for a uh, big uh, <coughs> bypass, uh, I drill the anterior and posterior petrosal space, and then the radial artery was nicely anastomosed with P2. And then after the trapping of the aneurysm, uh, the patient recovered well. Uh, let me show you the transcondylar fossa approach for lower posterior circulation, uh, such as vertebral artery and pica. When we treat these aneurysms, I usually uh, use the uh, occipital artery to posterior inferior cerebral artery uh, or a pica bypass for these complex aneurysms. And, and the transcondylar, the wide working space for this bypass as well as aneurysm manipulation. This is a cadaveric specimen. And uh, this here is the uh, anterior posterior. And this is a, uh, this is cranial caudal. This is the right side. Uh, craniotomy is already suboccipital craniotomy is performed and foramen magnum is opened. Now you can see the stump of posterior condylar emissary vein. Transcondylar fossa approach means the drilling the trans, uh, tr uh, drilling the condylar fossa. Uh, this is a bone around this uh, emissary vein. So by drilling this space to the uh, inferior end, inferior edge of the sig uh, sigmoid sinus, uh, you can get a nice view to the vertebral artery and pica. By doing this, uh, I have treated these cases. This is a hemodynamic uh, ischemia caused by the bilateral vertebral artery dissection. And these cases are unclippable vertebral artery or pica aneurysms. I'll show you the case. This is a 70 year old woman presenting uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage WFNS grade five, it's poor grade. And now you can see the thick subarachnoid clot in her posterior fossa. And she had a 
uh, left a very small uh, VA pica aneurysm. Uh, I decided to uh, clip or trap uh, this aneurysm uh, under the assist of OA pica bypass. This is an operative view of this aneurysm. Now you know that this aneurysm is located very deep uh, behind the orifice of pica. This is our operative video. First EVD was inserted. This is occipital artery. Occipital muscles are dissected. And occipital artery was uh, well harvested. Craniotomy is completed. Under the microscope, uh, I started drilling the uh, condera fossa. Uh, this is a stamp of the posterior condera emissary vein. And uh, condera dr fossa drilling is completed now. After the opening the dura, I expose the caudal loop of pica and OA pica uh, bypass was performed. The bypass looks very good. Actually, the this aneurysm ruptured before the fine manipulation of the aneurysm. I decided to trap this aneurysm. This is a proximal clip uh, occluding both uh, aneurysm and uh, proximal pica. So this is a second clip on the distal pica. The result of this operation was good. CT angio shows the aneurysm is gone and the bypass is okay. Uh, this uh, poor grade uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage woman recovered very well and she was discharged home with modified ranking scale one. Uh, independent state. So poor grade subarachnoid hemorrhage of posterior fossa sometimes recovers very well, so we don't have to give up. In summary, a hybrid strategy for complex aneurysms should be designed so that direct surgery and the vascular procedure cover each other in terms of accessibility, invasiveness, and long-term durability. Skull-based technique provides wider operative view in complex aneurysm surgery, especially in cases with deep bypass procedure. That's it. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Fukuda, with this uh, very nice informative presentation, amazing cases with, and, and more amazing results, actually. I really congratulate you. On, on achieving excellent outcomes in these very complex patients. Um, we have uh, one question here for you that uh, is uh, in subarachnoid WFNS high grades like 405. Do you do intervention, clipping or coiling immediately or do you wait uh, until the patient improves uh, in terms of like clinical uh, symptoms? And uh, actually, the, we always treat the grade four patient. Uh, there's no reason to wait for the grade four patient. And in terms of grade five, uh, it's case by case, I guess. If this grade five uh, means like uh, bilateral pupil dilatation or the uh, vital, uh, vital sign, uh, unstable or something that, that we have to wait. But if possible, patient, if patient is stable, uh, we you know, treat the, the, this patient. But for the poor grade subarachnoid hemorrhage, we think that endovascular coiling will less, less invasive. So we, we, recommend the endovascular coiling, but in some cases like a dissection or the very mini size aneurysm or something like that, sometimes we have to do the surgery for that patient.
Uh, do you got use like a stent assist or fluid diversions, like any treatment that requires antiplatelets in acute phase after ruptured aneurysms? And in my in my experience, uh, I have never used. I use a flow diverter, but only in the chronic stage. So I have never used a flow diverter. Actually, I uh, I use the stent assisted coiling a um, couple of times. Uh, just like, but it's just uh, like uh, intentional. I mean, the, it's kind of a troubleshooting, uh, just like uh, the annual, mm -hmm. uh, the coil or uh, migrated uh, to the parent artery or something like that. In such a case, we load, we load the antiplatelet and then put the stent on. Okay. Because, you know, for example, your first case that was, was a very complex ophthalmic segment aneurysm that required a high flow bypass and clipping and then coiling. If it was like, just if you assume that, I mean, if it was in, of course, a non-rupture, the treatment could be like much more straightforward, but it's still in acute phase. Some people go ahead and do fluid diversions. You do not recommend that. No, uh, actually no. Uh, in, in the meantime, <laughs> If the, you know, the endovascular devices are uh, developing very, very fast. So maybe in 10 years, uh, there are some like, uh, yeah, I think the in intracircular devices are very uh, hopeful or something like that. But at this point, and actually the, in the subarachnoid hemorrhage case, uh, the, I think the preventing re-rupture is the most important. So that's why that we prefer the like complete occlusion of the annulus by the parent artery occlusion in such a case. I, I, I completely agree because, you know, using as flow diverters could make some of these hybrid com or like complex treatments such as bypasses, trapping, uh, or combined treatments like um, um, not required in some cases. But again, as you said, the definite answer to these ruptured questions could not be a treatment like, for example, even intrastacular devices like web or contour. We know that they don't give you like immediate security of the aneurysm. Though the outcome shows that yes, the chance of like uh, rupture rate is, is small, re-rupturing could be small, even in spite of partial secure, partially securing the aneurysm, but there is still not a definite answer and we cannot take risk uh, with just letting the patient to have a live aneurysm. I completely agree with you on being more aggressive in terms of doing treatment. Also for, yes, we have some evidence for uh, the, the, the in information of our audience that uh, yes, flow diversion or stent assisted could be used probably safely in acute phase. But uh, you know, when you wanna place EVDs, when you wanna like manage those EVDs or sometimes they may require multiple interventions or even surgeries, craniotomies, having a patient on dual uh, antiplatelets in acute phase is not always desirable and sometimes worsens the outcome. And putting them on only single uh, antiplatelet, again, would have between 10 to 20% chance of uh, uh, thromboembolic uh, events. So thinking about full flow diversity in acute phase may not be a good idea, at least with the current uh, uh, technology that we have. Yeah, I totally agree with you. The, that's why I use uh, like a high flow bypass with uh, parent artery occlusion. After that, uh, you know, the, we are a little bit uh, mentally okay because after the complete occlusion of the annulus and without antiplatelet, we don't have to uh, worry about anything like uh, EVD related uh, bleeding from the brain or something like that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Nori. Uh, yes. May I ask a question? Please. Yes, of okay. course, please. Uh, Dr. Fukuda, uh, thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, I have one question about the uh, second case uh, of staged hybrid su surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, ICPC is uh, large aneurysm, and uh, uh, you did STPC bypass followed by a uh, peak uh, occlusion or with coils. And uh, uh, we have uh, three cases of si similar cases. And uh, I worried about uh, occlusion of PCOM perforator. 
uh, this is because uh, uh, followed by a uh, sorry a, after STPC bypass you did uh, PCOM uh, occlusion with coil and uh, uh, proximal side proximal side of PCOM is a stump and uh, uh, some perforator is arising from this area so uh, I worried about the risk of uh, occlusion. Uh, due to uh, direct obliteration with coil or uh, extended to thrombosis. Uh, we have one case of uh, extended thrombosis occlusion. Uh, um, how do you think of uh, this risk? Yeah, uh, I agree with you. The, if the perforator uh, is getting some uh, stump, I mean the uh, blunt end, the some uh, <coughs> thrombotic uh, complication may happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have a, a answer, but the uh, one report from Tohoku University says uh, uh, the risk of perforator infection uh, by this. Uh, Brand end uh, strategy is associated with uh, uh, how much the bypass flow mm -hmm. is obtained. So, uh, yeah, actually, the best way is uh, make a, a bigger uh, bypass flow. I mean, a mm -hmm. larger bypass flow uh, to the aneurysm. Uh, actually, the for example, the we sometimes. Uh, Cut the peak on, uh, mm -hmm. when the, we are doing some basilar clipping or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I think the, for the peak on perforator, it's a little bit rare compared with the anterior choroidal artery. Mm -hmm. But, uh, as you, as you told me, uh, there are some cases and, uh, mm -hmm. but I think in, in this case, uh, the aneurysm uh, keep growing, growing, growing. Mm. So <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah, the yes. small risk of the perforator mm -hmm. infection yeah, can I, be accepted. I agree with you. Uh, I agree with you. And uh, you do uh, you continue uh, systemic heparinization uh, after bypass uh, after peak occlusion. Uh, pre uh, this is prevention of uh, extended thrombosis. Uh, probably, you agree? Uh, you mean that the same case, the PCOM aneurysm case, PCOM aneurysm case? Yes. And uh, uh, after PCOM occlusion, uh, I think uh, systemic heparinization for prevention of extended thrombosis is uh, uh, needed. Perforator. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, actually, the, I didn't continue the heparinization mm -hmm. and the natural reverse of the, mm -hmm. of the heparin. Mm, yeah, nothing. Ah, but the uh, uh, ant, uh, antiplatelet, oh. single antiplatelet mm -hmm. uh, is continued. Uh, mm -hmm. Aspirin is continued mm -hmm. because uh, he had uh, uh, multiple stents already. Mm -hmm. So the under the antiplatelet, I we perform this one. So mm -hmm. maybe the single uh, single antiplatelet therapy uh, may be mm -hmm. very good at, mm -hmm. uh, for that, that for that case. Mm, thank you very much. Uh, and what, what, one, one uh, important factor here as well, when you have these vessels who have a stump at one end, if you want to sacrifice the vessel, and if it's better usually to use a clip rather than coil, because when you use a clip, clip does not cause like a thrombogenic mm -hmm. uh, of the vessel. When you put coil, coil per se is thrombogenic. So not just for PCOM, for anywhere else, even in like ICA, let's say. When you, when you occlude the ICA with just coils and that coil is exposed to the blood flow, that, that coil is thrombogenic. So it may cause us like distal thromboembolism even later. So usually what is recommended, if it's technically feasible, it's better to use a clip because that clip is going to be outside the vessel, just occlude the vessel and you have normal endothelium inside. That endothelium would not be exposed to uh, coils that are thrombogenic. It's usually better, if possible, technically, to occlude and sacrifice the vessels with clips rather than coils. I see. But uh, in that case, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Nori, the, do you think uh, uh, do you think to put the clip at the distal, uh, I'm distal to the uh, perforator or the proximal? I think the proximal clipping is not feasible. 
Yeah, so, no, no, no. I was talking about if, if it's feasible. That's okay. that's why I emphasize that multiple times. I completely trust your uh, intraoperative judgment. And I'm sure if, as you were there and if you could find that place to place that clip proximal to the perforators, you would have done that. I'm sure you couldn't find appropriate uh, location for placing the clip. And that's why you went with coiling. Yeah. Because again, if you place that clip there, you would prevent a possible protrusion of the coils into the PCA as well, into the PCOM, I mean. And that would be that would be easier, but I'm sure you couldn't find that 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 uh, appropriate location for your clips at that point. That's right. If you will find that, if you will find that stump and that segment, even uh, end to end uh, uh, anastomosis of the pecan with STA could also be an option. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting discussion. Yes, I would like to ask one question to Professor Fukuda is regarding that ophthalmic aneurysm where you embolize the ophthalmic artery. What was the visual outcome in that eye? Ah, uh, visual outcome. Yeah. Yes. Actually, high visual outcome was very good. Uh, you you know that uh, even though we occlude the just the orifice of the ophthalmic artery, maybe the ninety five percent of the visual uh, acuity is very good. But actually, this is the acute subarachnoid hemorrhage, and uh, she suffered she suffered uh, from the uh, life uh, threatening disease. So actually, uh, we did not care about that. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Any questions, my co-host Libun Singh? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Raja. Uh, thanks, Professor Goda, for a very nice uh, presentation. Uh, Professor, uh, I would be interested in your hemostatic, uh, heparin hemostatic uh, technique that you show uh, for the patient with the cardiac arrhythmia. Uh, may I know if that case you're going to use a stand uh, and you need to give antiplatelet. So do you do anything to reverse anything? Because you can't do it for the hemostatic part. So how best do you do to make sure the hemostatic is controlled? Uh, my second question, Professor, uh, regarding those cases that you go for embolization with a very thick subronic hemorrhage, uh, do you do wash up after that? Uh, I mean, because uh, I think Japan is very famous for doing a subronic hemorrhage wash up. So in those cases, will you do a wash up? And if subsequently after uh, embolization, the patient develops hydrocephalus, uh, would you do any reversal for the antiplatelet uh, for you to put in the EVD, Professor? Thank you. And actually, in Japan, uh, we only have an oral antiplatelet, so we have uh, no uh, reversal uh, uh, method uh, to the antiplatelet therapy. So, the, for the first question, and uh, actually, we didn't use the uh, we didn't use the antiplatelet because uh, this was uh, the craniotomy was planned, so that we. Uh, put the cold, put the cold in the annual without uh, antiplatelet, but we used a little bit uh, stronger heparinization to the patient to uh, pre uh, prevent the uh, thrombosis uh, in the first case. And uh, uh, subarachnoid clot washing, uh, actually, yeah, uh, as you know, there are some uh, neurosurgeons in Japan is. <laughs> Kind of crazy to <laughs> wash out the subarachnoid clot. Uh, it is uh, believed to prevent the uh, uh, vasospasm or the hydrocephalus. Uh, but uh, actually, the washing out the subarachnoid hemorrhage is a little bit uh, yeah, technically challenging in some cases, and sometimes uh, uh, we may uh, injure the surface of the brain. So I personally. Yeah, I wash out the uh, clot uh, around the aneurysm, but not so extensively. So in such a case, there's no, not so much a uh, bleeding risk uh, or from the surface of the brain. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Yes, Joe. Joe is a current fellow with Professor Kato. Would you like to ask something? Hi, thank you, Dr. Raja. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Kuda. That was a very brilliant lecture. Uh, very insightful. I would like to ask, uh, you showed a, a slide regarding uh, aneurysm regrowth and uh, compaction of the coils. Um, when do you decide when you 
uh, reclip them or decide to recoil? Is it strictly based on what you showed that if it's regrowth, you clip? And if it's coil compaction, uh, you would go for coiling again. When do you decide for which things? Yeah, yeah. it's a nice question. Uh, the reality is, at the first recurrence of the aneurysm, actually we cannot uh, uh, we cannot uh, find uh, whether this is a, uh, just a compaction or the aneurysmal regrowth because if the even if it is animal, aneurysmal regrowth, as the first uh, recurrence, we don't know if it is enlarging or not. So for the first recurrence, actually, I always select the uh, re-embolization. The, but the, sometimes in the aneurysmal growth, uh, regrowth case, there's a second uh, recurrence. So I, I personally think the second recurrence only uh, is only seen for the aneurysmal regrowth. And then the, uh, regarding whether we use a clip or cause, um, actually the clipping of the uh, aneurysmal regrowth with a, a small uh, neck remnant is technically very, very challenging. Uh, actually, I have, uh, yes, I have done some cases, but uh, uh, it depends on the, how much a uh, neck remnant is. Uh, observed but uh, we cannot uh, wait until the, there's a big uh, neck remnant uh, because uh, uh, some uh, aneurysm will uh, rupture again while we are waiting so we have to decide uh, before the neck remnant is getting very big so it's very controversial so probably such kind of uh, sidewall conversion or sometime uh, something uh, should be considered Ari. Thank you very much. We have Professor Parmasiam has a raised hand, please. Dr. Fukura, that was a wonderful presentation. We Thank enjoyed you. your talk. And um, in, in an era, today we live in an era where the endovascular devices are rapidly improving and new devices are coming in. And in this, in your series of cases, uh, were you forced to take these options because most of these devices, I think, are still not available in Japan, if I am correct? Uh, you you mean the new devices? Such as, yeah, we can use a flow diverter, and okay. now the we can use a web, and uh, maybe that's it. Probably the yeah. doctor uh, Professor Tsuruta is more familiar with that. Okay, I mean, the pipeline mm -hmm. shield, is it available in Japan? Pipeline is available. Yes, uh, pipeline shield is available. Mm. Okay, and with regards to, I mean, uh, intrasaclate devices, you know, widely available in India is web and contour. A good number of uh, abnormally shaped aneurysms because contour is relatively much simpler to size it and place it within the aneurysm uh, compared to web. And... Uh, Contour uh, is very promising going forward for uh, wide-necked complex aneurysms. Yeah, I, had, uh, I, I hear that, okay, I will start to use a web uh, maybe <laughs> next month, but not the contour. So, yeah, uh, what do you think about uh, uh, Professor Tsuruta about uh, uh, new intra-aneurysmal uh, device? Uh, yes, I think uh, web is uh, effective uh, for or very wide neck type, uh, but uh, size selection uh, is very difficult. Uh, sometimes it's too large and uh, too small. Uh, it's uh, size selection is very uh, important and it's sometimes difficult. Uh, uh, we cannot use uh, uh, con uh, conca. Contour. Uh, con sorry. Contour. <laughs> Contour. Contour. Uh, it's, uh, uh, the shape is uh, rugby ball. Rugby ball. Like, uh, 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 what is the shape? Uh, like saucer, a saucer like, saucer like, <laughs> saucer like. Yes. Uh, we have no experience of, uh, this device, but I expect uh, it. Yeah, we hope we can use it shortly. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, all the panelists and uh, wonderful speaker and chair. We can have the last word from our honorable chair, Professor Mohsin Nori, before we wind up. 
Um, yeah, I think um, we discussed everything uh, uh, among the among their esteemed panelists. Um, again, as as we we started with, we still know that there are so many challenges in treating the aneurysms. Many devices are coming to the market. Uh, some of them survive, some of them just fall out of favor after a couple of years because, I mean, the initial result is promising, but the long-term result comes back as uh, recanalization rate is high or like a failure to, uh, in, in treatment is, is, uh, is high. So we are still struggling with treating complex cases, both open vas with open vascular or endovascular techniques. And I think this was a very brilliant idea, very uh, uh, inspirational, I think, to all of us to know that we have uh, alternatives in our armamentarium. They're not fighting with each other. They're just there to help each other. So if you know how to use them appropriately, both open surgeries, bypass clipping versus endovascular, you could achieve the best outcome for our patients. Thank you again so much, Dr. Fukuda, for this wonderful presentation to bring up this topic. Thank you very much. Well, thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, a very lively session and wonderful discussion. I would like to mention to our viewers that currently we are logged in through WeChat, YouTube, and Zoom. And thanks to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. As of now, we are today joined by 560 people from around the globe to watch this webinar. So now it's time. We'll move on to the second session. Yes. So I'll hand this uh, platform over to our second chair, Professor Vatara Surata. Professor, all yours. Yes. OK. Uh, the topic of second lecture is history of evolution of endovascular treatment for stroke uh, by Professor Paramashivam uh, from India. Uh, for introduction, uh, stroke is a leading cause of disability worldwide. Uh, in the last two or three decades, uh, endovascular therapy for ischemic stroke has significantly advanced uh, from intraarterial thrombolysis through the MEDC device uh, to current stent read rivers and uh, aspiration catheters. Uh, the evolution of thrombectomy devices, uh, techniques, and imaging technology dramatically changed uh, stroke management uh, by increasing functional independence uh, and expanding the time window for eligible patients. A series of clinical trials demonstrated uh, the result of uh, benefit of endovascular therapy in proximal anterior circulation, large vessel occlusion. Uh, but uh, we have still uh, issues to resolve, uh, such as distal MCA lesion, uh, posterior circulation, late time windows, and uh, low aspect score. Did uh, undergoing evaluation? Uh, today, uh, Dr. Paramashivam uh, maybe refer to distal MCA, uh, distal vessel occlusion uh, of thromb uh, thrombectomy. Uh, okay, uh, we are looking forward to today's lecture. Uh, Dr. Paramashivam, uh, please start your lex lecture. Thank you, uh, Dr. Vatero, uh, Professor Vatero, for the wonderful uh, introduction. Thank you, uh, Raja and team for this uh, wonderful um, platform to uh, present on the evolution of endovascular management of acute ischemic stroke. The ischemic stroke treatment has evolved over a period of time. And we are getting to a point like a heart attack. People are aware of this. We are trying to popularize the term brain attack so that people know what stroke is and they come into the hospital and we are able to treat them effectively. When I was in the medical school, acute ischemic stroke had no significant treatment. And in fact, we did not even care about that disease. We said once a stroke is hit, the patient is disabled forever. But today we are able to change the fate of these patients because of a significant evolution in the treatment. Obviously, brain is a very, very active organ. It consumes about 20% of all the oxygen that we take in, and it uses 25% of glucose that we consume. And it needs constant supply of oxygen and glucose because it has no ability to store. And the blood supply is absolutely mandatory. And the stroke has been described by 
Hippocrates 2,400 years ago as an apoplexy struck down by violence. It's a dysfunction of the affected part of the brain, either due to ischemia or due to hemorrhage of a ruptured vessel. And it's a, a third leading cause of death and a number one cause of disability. Apart from disability, a disabled person at home in countries, in a developing country uh, uh, across the globe, uh, it not only disables or burdens the individual, but it burdens the whole family as well as the society as well, because taking care of them is time consuming and it's laborious and it is uh, extremely expensive. Just coming to the types of stroke, obviously the most common type of stroke is an ischemic stroke, which constitutes about 80%, whereas a hemorrhagic stroke constitutes about 20%. Coming to the acute ischemic stroke, that's where the significant evolution has happened. I'm going to concentrate on that. With the acute ischemic stroke, <clears throat> due to large vessel occlusion, every passing minute, about 2 million neurons are lost. And compared to the normal brain with the neuronal loss, the ischemic brain ages about 3.6 years every hour that passes by. So we need to treat these patients on time. Time is brain. Going forward, we know that the brain does not store energy, but till we treat, how does the brain survive? It's because of these leptomeningeal collaterals. These leptomeningeal collaterals are extremely important. These are the collaterals. <clears throat> At the skull base, we have the circle of villus. At the cortical surface, we have these leptomeningeal collaterals. It's between the ACA and MCA, ACA and PCA, as well in the posterior circulation, you have it between the SCA uh, <clears throat> and, and the other vessels like ICA and PICA. Whenever we do an angiogram for an acute ischemic stroke, a picture like this, see as in the late phase of the arterial and early venous phase, if you see the collaterals coming all the way down to the occluded point, we know that the brain would be preserved and we will be able to give them a better outcome. And a part of the brain would be affected and a part of penumbra, which is the region surrounding the brain, which is still not dead, but this is the region which we are trying to salvage. The core is already dead. We will not be able to reverse it, but larger the penumbra, the better would be the clinical outcome. So that's what we are targeting in an acute ischemic stroke. Taking you through briefly the evolution, what has happened is uh, <clears throat> in 1996, uh, FDA approved the intravenous thrombolytics. Subsequently, intraarterial thrombolytics were proposed, not really very popular because at that time, not many centers across the globe were doing endovascular. Then came the era of endovascular thrombectomy, and I'm happy to have lived through this uh, phase where this device and treatments were developed, and we are able to offer treatment effectively. We have come to a level where we are able to extend the window and offer treatment for up to 24 hours, and but technically, we have gone well beyond that. And in fact, in the last two to three decades, we have made a giant leap with regards to the treatment of acute ischemic stroke. How did this evolution exactly happen? I will just take you through briefly the evolution process that has happened. As far as the evolution in the medical management of acute ischemic stroke is concerned, the TPA was the first drug that was officially approved for treatment of acute ischemic stroke. Initially, after this uh, NINDS trial, which was published in NEJM in 1995. The TPA was approved for acute ischemic stroke for up to three hours. So that was the beginning of the actual specific treatment for an acute ischemic stroke. Then in 1999, people had the idea of intra-arterial thrombolytics, going inside the blood vessel and giving locally intra-arterial thrombolytics. It did not take off well. The trials um, like the PROAC trial and those trials did not take off well because there was not many centers to take up the uh, treatment and there were not many operators trained in uh, treating acute strokes and there were very few centers offering endovascular treatment at that time. Then people had the idea of uh, bridging therapy where intra-arterial and then intravenous followed by intra-arterial thrombolysis. People also tried using the external ultrasound to lyse the clot and enable uh, the in, uh, drug, the intra-arterial and intravenous drug to take more um, effect. Then came the European Cooperative Acute Stroke Study, ECAS-3 trial, which extended the window of in, uh, TPA from say three and a half hours to four and a half hours. And even today, this stands as the gold standard for patients with acute ischemic stroke up to four and a half hours. We offer 
uh, intra-arterial, uh, sorry, intravenous thrombolytics. And we have moved on from uh, TPA to tenactiplase in, in our part of the world because the tenactiplase in the recent studies are showing promising results. So this is about the medical management. Coming to the endovascular management, Obviously, a significant evolution has happened in the endovascular management of acute ischemic stroke. Obviously, we access either through the groin or sometimes through the radial to access. The first and the dedicated device that was approved for acute ischemic stroke was the Mercy device. The simplest, the first generation of Mercy device was the simplest of device like a corkscrew device. Before that, people were trying to do thrombectomy or to disturb the clot by using various methods like you know partially deploying a coil and then uh, uh, resheathing it and uh, using the microcatheter and wire to shuffle out the clot but this mercy device made a change because it was dedicated to acute ischemic stroke and then a lot of modification happened in this mercy device they introduced a lot of these uh, nylon wires in the device and they changed the shape of the device so that it becomes more effective and, and whatever was done with these Mercy device, the clinical efficiency was about the recanalization rates range somewhere between 40 to 50 percent, whereas with TPA it was about 25 percent. So it was effective, but not to the level that we think it could have been effective. So the Mercy device was introduced in 2004. Subsequently, <clears throat> uh, came the uh, Penumbra device in 2008. This is a a technological marvel because they thought aspirating the clot could have been more effective and then they introduced these separators. There were three different catheters for different sizes of the vessels and um, the separators are the ones which have bulbous end and a very soft tip and you place this catheter at the level of the clot and then the other end of the catheter is connected to an aspiration canister and this pump sucks the negative, uh, puts a negative pressure on the catheter and through the separator, you separate out the clot uh, by moving it back and forth. And it was a quite effective treatment. And in fact, using this device, we have achieved uh, about, say, 70 to 80 percent recanalization in the various um, uh, series that has been published. So compared to Mercy device, this device was a game changer and it made the uh, stroke treatment a real possibility, especially in large vessel occlusions. And in 2008, obviously the penumbra device was introduced and since then we have been using it quite effectively. Then came the dawn of the new era, that is the stent reverse. The stent reverse was actually an accidental uh, finding. Uh, when when uh, trying to remove a clot, people used the aneurysm bridging uh, device, that's a stent partially deployed and they pulled out the clot, it worked well. And they thought, why don't we use this as a primary device and it was stuck to the stick and it was adherent to a pushing wire so that this device became very popular. Today, we have multiple stent reverse, like the Solitaire, Trivo, uh, and, and we have about 10 different stent reverse that we have in the market. And the way it works is, uh, for people who are not used to doing these endovascular, I'll just show you a short video. Uh, this is from Stryker. So you put the microcatheter across the clot, after passing the wire, you allow the strength reverse to be placed across the clot and you wait for about five to seven minutes. These strength reverse have a memory and with the body temperature, they expand and grab the clot. You arrest the flow in the vessel and you retrieve the clot. So this is how the strength reverse works. And with the strength reverse, our chances of recanalization and revascularization significantly improve. Before that, we thought anything achieving a partial recanalization, anything TK2 was good, but then our bar uh, uh, increased. So we, we always achieved, we wanted to achieve TK2 B or TK3 recanalization in, in almost all the cases. This is one of the early cases that I've done. A 74 year old male with a hypertension, dyslipidemia, MA about eight years ago had coronary stent placement. He was on Plavix, he was found down at about 8.30 a.m. In the EI, he had a right MCA syndrome with an stroke scale of 18. CT was done and intravenous TPA was given and then he was pushed to the uh, cath lab and we did the intervention which started at about 11.30 a.m. So this was the initial angiogram, the strength trivo was placed. This is actually the trivo probe view, the, one of the first use of trivo probe view 
they have made these trend triggers quite visible, which is extremely helpful uh, in, in acute strokes because we do most of these procedures awake and we know exactly where we are placing these trend triggers and uh, the deployment is uh, quite visible and you can see that when we initially place the strength river is compressed and subsequently with the grabbing the cloth the strength river expands so all these information are extremely useful in uh, retrieving the cloth so this is at the end of uh, retrieval you can see the recanalization is achieved the patient recovered well with a small residual stroke but the clinical recovery was pretty good when we were juggernauting and moving forward with uh, good results in acute ischemic stroke, we were excited. But the three trials, the IMS3 trial, the uh, MR rescue trial, the synthesis expansion trial came and they uh, proved that the mechanical thrombectomy is not effective. Very unfortunate because these trials were done with older devices. Most of the patients enrolled were uh, treated with Mercy device and few with the Penumbra device and the enrollment was pretty poor but clinically we knew that this uh, treatment is quite effective and in the United States the uh, insurance companies did continue to sponsor or did continue to reimburse for the mechanical thrombectomy because they too knew that it's going to be effective otherwise they'd be paying for the patient's disability uh, till the patient's death. So we continued with the treatment for acute ischemic stroke in spite of the negative results that came up in 2014. Uh, then was introduced the direct aspiration catheter. This is a catheter, this is an ACE catheter from Penumbra, uh, which has about say eight to 10 transition zones to make the catheter really soft and extremely supple at the more distal end and more robust at the proximal end. This was designed by an intern in the company and the intern was a very young intern who had the idea. Usually most catheters have about three to four transition zones. Here they made about eight to 10 transition zones so that the catheter can climb up the cranial circulation, especially in older people with tortuous vessels. You can see here the direct aspiration works this way. First you put the microwire, then the microcatheter, and then you take up the aspiration catheter up to the clot in very simple um, uh, anatomy, you can take up the aspiration catheter directly like the snake technique with Sophia, but in most situations, we would take it up with the microwire and the microcatheter and you, and you apply the suction for about say four to five minutes. Most of the time, there is no blood flow in the system, which means the clot is grabbed. You pull it out gently and you can take out the whole clot. This is extremely advantageous because this technique is very, very fast and you can achieve recanalization in a very short time. A lot of people have achieved recanalization in about, say, 8 to 10 minutes. My fastest time is about 13 minutes in terms of recanalization. So the ACE catheter was a game changer again, not in terms of achieving more recanalization, but faster recanalization. So that, that was very, very effective. So this is one such case. Uh, as you can see here, there is a clot in the M1. We are taking up the stent river and we remove the clot and the recanalization was achieved. And these uh, re, uh, aspiration catheters have increased in size since then. Uh, they introduced the 064, then the 068, and today in market from various companies, we have 070 to 072 uh, aspiration catheters. I'll just show you a few examples. This is a patient with the left M1 occlusion, present with an acute ischemic stroke. There's a clot that was removed and complete recanalization was achieved. Uh, another one, a 63-year-old male with a hypertension diabetes, AFib, last known well about 4 p.m., reached the hospital at 6.30. He had a symptoms of non-specific symptoms of lethargy, disconjugate gaze, and mild quadriparesis. NA stroke scale was 14. People thought it could be encephalopathy in the ER. The, by then, uh, the patient started deteriorating and the patient needed an intubation. So this is a presentation of one such posterior circulation stroke. They don't present classically like an anterior circulation stroke, atrophic brain. You can see the CT angio showed a basilar occlusion. Here, the anatomy was quite straightforward. You can see the guiding catheter and we are able to get up the uh, aspiration catheter without a lead wire or the microcatheter. And you can see it climbing quite well. We placed it at the clot level and did a direct aspiration and this whole process takes about five to six minutes uh, in, in terms of uh, from puncture to reaching the clot. And you can see here the clot was retrieved 
and the patient made a dramatic clinical recovery. The patient was extubated the next day. In about a week's time, the patient was discharged. In about two to three weeks, you can see the patient back in the office, completely normal. And he is doing all his activities and uh, he sees back to his baseline. So such kind of uh, recovery is possible with this endovascular treatment. And it is very fast with the direct aspiration. Uh, age is no bar in acute ischemic stroke, 81 year old female. I mean, age is just a number. The premorbid clinical condition is what is extremely important. Uh, 81 year old female developed an acute ischemic stroke uh, as she was drinking coffee at about 5 10 p.m. And the, uh, she was brought to the hospital in a quick time, in, in less than one and a half hours. Initial stroke scale was 18, initial CT scan was normal. Patient had an ICA occlusion. As you can see here, there's no ICA visualized. This was the initial um, uh, run on the roadmap. We put a direct aspiration catheter, aspirated the clot, achieved good renalization, and the patient made a very good recovery. And um, especially for patients where you cannot thrombolize, uh, this is a 70 year old female with acute onset of right hemiplegia, came within three hours of duration. The patient had a recent surgery, so we couldn't do any thrombolysis. We got the patient directly to the cath lab. As you can see here, uh, this is the initial angiogram. Had a good, uh, fairly decent leptomeningeal collaterals. We know that this patient is going to do well. We're able to achieve TK3 recanalization, which was achieved in this case. This was a fibrin clot, a white color clot, as you can see here. And puncture to recanalization time was about 13 minutes. This was one of my fastest case. And you can see there are various types of clots. We get a RBC-rich clot or a fibrin-rich clot. And, and these clots depend on from where they arise. Then between 2015 and 16 came the golden period for mechanical thrombectomy. Mr. Clean, the uh, trial from Netherlands followed by subsequent trials, ESCAPE, Extend IA, SWIFT Prime, REVAS, Therapy, TRACE trial, all proved that mechanical thrombectomy is a very effective treatment for acute ischemic stroke. And uh, the, the way we assess the patient after the stroke is by MRS. Uh, you all know what MRS means. And the evidence for intra-arterial mechanical thrombectomy is quite robust now. And there is no looking back. And we need to look forward to uh, how to advance this therapy. That's what happened from there on. So uh, in 2015, these trials came. Uh, and, and I'll just show you a few examples we, uh, before we move on. A 34-year-old male with a sudden onset right-sided weakness, uh, dysphasia, onset about 4.30 p.m., came to the hospital at 6 p.m. Uh, the vessels were fairly well visualized. Thrombolysis was done. Patient recovered well, but deteriorated again the next morning at about 6 a.m., following which a repeat MRI showed multiple uh, infarcts in the brain. And the repeat MR angiogram showed the left ICA was not well visualized. So we took him up to the cath lab. We saw this kind of a clot, possibly a dissection with the clot formation and a tandem occlusion uh, dis in the distal ICA, distal to the ophthalmic origin. Direct aspiration of the clot in the neck was done and the clots were all uh, retrieved. We went up there. Again, a direct aspiration was done to pull out the clot from the M1 and a good recanalization was achieved and the patient made a good recovery. A little hanging clot like this, we would uh, wait and watch and put the patient on antiplatelets. Uh, usually such clots uh, resolve over a period of time. So this is the CT scan right after. So in a little reperfusion related changes in the brain, which is quite common after such thrombectomies, uh, but, but overall the patient makes a very good recovery. Moving on, what happened next was a, a dramatic event. That is, we extend the window from a short window of six, hours, six to eight hours to 24 hours. What exactly happens, as I told you earlier, there is a core of infarct and surrounding region is the ischemic penumbra. That's what we are trying to target. As time passes by, this is what happens. In the first six hours, the penumbra is quite large. But as time passes by, the penumbra decreases. And this is not uniform for everybody. Some people are lucky to have a good amount of leptomeningeal collaterals in whom uh, we could offer thrombectomy for a much longer period. So we have to select these patients. We select these patients based on imaging. And based on imaging, these two trials selected patients and proven that thrombectomy up to 
24 hours is effective. This was a Dawn trial, which was published subsequently in 2018, which showed that uh, uh, thrombectomy is effective for up to 24 hours. And uh, in the subset analysis as well, they have proven that thrombectomy is effective in properly selected patients for whom mechanical thrombectomy is done between 6 to 12 hours and uh, between 12 and 24 hours as well. Then came uh, the diffuse three trial. Again, they, their timeline was between six and 16 hours. And again, they, pro, uh, uh, they proved that if patient is properly selected by proper imaging, either using a CT perfusion or uh, MR images uh, with, with the perfusion softwares, you can select the patients appropriately and offer treatment uh, and have good results. So we commonly use either a CT perfusion in most situations, and in certain centers where we don't have CT perfusion, we do the MR, and we also have this rapid software. In in uh, uh, we cover about uh, five six centers, and uh, in about half the centers we have the rapid software, which helps us in making the decision. As far as the MR, when we do MR, we have a stroke protocol which takes about say uh, eighteen to twenty minutes to do the entire sequence, which uh, is uh, which comprises of DWI images. ADC, the uh, mean transit time, the, that's a perfusion image. Then the flare image, we usually train our residents to look at um, uh, diffusion weighted images and flare image mismatch and the gradient echo as well we do to, to understand the type of clot, to differentiate between a fibrin rich clot and the RBC clot. We also do a rapid MR angiogram to help us guide in the treatment. So uh, having a institutionalized uh, protocol to have a rapid quick MRI is also extremely useful. So the dawn and diffuse trials have extended the window to 24 hours. Next, moving forward, what else can we do? We need to, there are a subset of patients who have more distal occlusions and they end up extremely disabled, especially with the left hemisphere occlusion. So we end up uh, doing mechanical thrombectomy for more distal vessels, that is A2, M2, M3, and sometimes to M4 as well. And these are Pro, uh, now proving to be a more effective treatment. And uh, the multicenter stop stroke study, which showed that uh, M2 occlusions, uh, when, when a thrombectomy is done, the patient became functionally uh, independent in, in good number of cases. And when um, intravenous thrombolytics failed to recanalize about say one half to two thirds of medium vessel occlusions, what are we left with? We need to do thrombectomies, especially with the left hemisphere where the uh, language function is at stake. So these distal medium vessel occlusions are primarily of two types. We, we look at them uh, differently. They may be a primary distal vessel occlusion where the occlusion is primarily there or secondary. There is a large vessel occlusion when we try to do thrombectomy, unintended emboli can fly off and occlude the uh, distal medium vessel. It can be in the same territory or a different territory. Do we have evidence? We don't have enough evidence now, but there are anecdotal reports from individual uh, institutions which are proving to be effective and each one have their personal experience as well in these uh, cases. As far as the Mr. Clean trial, only about 8% of the trial population had uh, thrombectomy of the M2s and more distal vessels, and it is not enough to uh, give us the guidelines. And we do thrombectomy quite uh, frequently for medium vessel occlusions with good results. Are we geared up with appropriate devices? Yes, the devices are getting into the market. And initially when we did thrombectomy for a stent river to be pushed in, we used a 027 microcatheter. Then came the devices which can be used to uh, used through a 021 microcatheter. Today there are devices which can be used through a 017 microcatheter. So these smaller devices are extremely useful because we can get these catheters up more distally and uh, put these st smaller stent reverse and do mechanical thrombectomy more efficiently. These are the microcatheters that we use uh, moving from 027 to 021 to 017 and the aspiration catheters are, are as well are improving. The red uh, 72 is, is one of the new kit in the block. Uh, along with that has come the uh, 68 and 62. The 62 is especially designed for more distal vessels direct aspiration. As far as the strength river is concerned, almost every company, as you can see here, come out with the devices. Usually we had like a four and a six millimeter devices in most companies. Today we have devices which are three millimeter and which are designed towards these medium and small vessel occlusions. 
So smaller aspiration catheters and smaller strain retrievers are coming into the market and flooding the market. And we know that these devices are readily available for distal medium vessel occlusion. As you can see, this is one of those devices retrieved with the strain retriever. Um, and and uh, here, a O27 micro catheter was used to do a, a direct aspiration initially before these smaller aspiration catheters were available. The distal occlusion may be a primary occlusion like this. In the left hemisphere, as you can see here, there is a <clears throat> angular artery which is occluded uh, in a 46-year-old male who is a H HIV patient on ART cardiomyopathy with a, C a CHF exacerbation. And he came to the hospital within two hours. Initial stroke scale was nine. And this M2 occlusion, uh, as you can see here, there is a branch which is occluded. And this is after we did the mechanical thrombectomy. We used a XT27 microcatheter with the standard wire directly aspirated with the microcatheter. It came out and, and the patient made a good recovery of his speech. And his stroke scale uh, for on day one uh, you know, improved from NIH of 9 to 0. Secondary DMOs are very common and we see it commonly emboli maybe to a new territory. For example, if you're doing an MC occlusion uh, and while pulling the clot out, the emboli can fly into an ACA, that is an emboli to new territory. And this is a fragmentation during pullback or embolization may happen to a distal territory. That is the same territory more distally. This is a fragmentation during engagement or during pullback. Mostly the soft erythrocyte clots are the ones which would embolize uh, distally. So we got to be very careful and uh, uh, gentle while re retrieving this clot and uh, uh, appropriately apply the aspiration so that fragmentation is minimized and balloon guide to reduce the risk of uh, distal fragmentation as well. As far as um, Hermes data suggests that embolization to new territory is about 10%, whereas embolization to the same territory happens in about 22, uh, say 24% of cases uh, with, with large vessel occlusion. And I'll just show you a few examples. This is a 77 year old male with the right side, the weakness with aphasia, Four and a half hours since last known well, NA stroke scale was 21. CTA showed a left ICA terminus occlusion. And this was the initial angiogram. We did a direct aspiration and retrieved the clot. Partial recanalization was achieved. As you can see here, there are multiple branches which are occluded. The clot has moved proximal to distal and it's occluding the small branches. In today's world, we can get to them and effectively treat them. So you can see here, the first branch was recanalized. Now the more distal branch, we get the catheter all the way up, put a small strength river and do a gentle pulling. I mean, we have to be very, very careful because these vessels can rip off easily. So it needs a lot of experience and it needs uh, proper engagement of the clot uh, by the strength retriever and partial resheathing of, of the strength retriever with the microcatheter is useful in retrieving this clot to achieve complete recanalization. A TK3 recanalization was achieved for, uh, after, after three passes here. And this was the CT scan immediately after the procedure. Uh, there's another case of 41 year or female with the right sided weakness with aphasia, a known case of thrombocytemia with the right uh, lower limb and upper limb ischemia as well. About three months ago, the patient was on Xeralto and aspirin. On top of it, the patient had this clot, so no thrombolysis was given. The patient uh, uh, was taken to the cath lab and this is the initial CT scan, CT angiogram showed already established some kind of an infarct, but we went ahead with the thrombectomy. This was the initial angiogram. This was after the first pass, as you can see here, uh, there is emboli. This was the long segment clot that we removed from the ICA and there were emboli to both new territory as well as to the distant territory. As you can see here, the ACA which was seen initially is not seen here. So there is an emboli here. We need to pick that up because this ACA in this particular patient is extremely, extremely important because it's supplying the collateral flow to the already occluded MCA branches. So we need to target that first. And in a quick time, we need to recanalize and reperfuse the ACA. So here I'm using Embotrap 2 and a complete recanalization of the ACA is achieved in a very quick time. And now I'm targeting the MCA distal occlusion branches. As you can see here, the, uh, the uh, strength river is placed and recanalizing one branch after the other to achieve good recanalization. This is another MCA distal branch, M3 to uh, M4 junction. 
again stent river removal of the clot and achieved good recanalization so you can chase these clots and achieve a good uh, tk3 recanalization in today's world if you are persistent and you lo you look for these clots and try to remove them this is another example i don't want to bore you see there is a distal emboli uh, emboli in the uh, same territory we are achieving recanalization uh, in, in that case, again, with the strength river. Now, coming to another aspect of mechanical thrombectomy is mechanical thrombectomy for low aspects and acute ischemic stroke. Do we have enough evidence? I mean, obviously, the Canadian school says there is enough evidence, but in, in our part of the world, it's very hard to do mechanical thrombectomy for low aspects. We have anecdotal evidence from individual institutions which say that acute ischemic stroke uh, uh, patients with aspects of less than five can experience good functional outcome after mechanical thrombectomy, provided we do a good TK3 recanalization. But a good number of them go for reperfusion, hemorrhage, and a lot of them would need decompression, uh, decompressive uh, craniectomy following the mechanical thrombectomy. But the 90-day outcome seems to be better. There are various trials which are happening at the moment and these trials would tell us or give us more insight into how effective this treatment is for low aspect score and should we be doing thrombectomy uh, in, in these patients. This is another study published in JAMA again showed that one in five patients presenting within aspects of two to five achieved 90-day functional independence after mechanical thrombectomy. And uh, favorable outcome was nearly five times more likely for patients with low aspect who had successful TK3 recanalization. The association of uh, uh, low aspects with 90-day outcome did not differ for patients presenting early or late. They compared patients presenting within six hours and patients presenting between six and 24 hours, and they did not find a significant difference. And there are trials going on in various parts of the world, the tension trial in extremist Tesla, select to rescue Japan limit trial. And these trials will certainly give us more input. And that's where we stand in terms of extending our uh, uh, armamentarium or expanding our indications for mechanical thrombectomy. In fact, this is a very, very busy slide. As you can see here, we have come a long way from medical management to endovascular treatment, and we are pushing the limits to achieve more and more recanalization. Together, we can make a difference in terms of uh, uh, eliminating the disability. So each center to achieve this kind of mechanical thrombectomy, apart from all the advances that is happening, you need to have a proper in-institution protocol uh, to, to uh, take care of stroke. We divide the stroke into four categories. One is the pre-arrival time or the triage. As soon as the patient comes, the triage is done and our time limit is pretty stringent and the patient is evaluated in the pre-CT or CTA phase and the imaging is done and the phase four is post-CTA phase. And each one has their role. For example, the emergency room, the secretary, nurse, registrar, consultant, everybody knows what they are supposed to do and we conduct a monthly drill so that everybody acts immediately. Everyone knows their role of action and nobody has to talk to each other uh, to, to, to get things done. Then the neurology registrar, consultant, everybody comes. We have a common paging system. So everybody are alerted, including the pharmacy to get the drug ready. The radiology technician would take the patient off the table and be ready to receive the patient. And likewise, our endovascular team is also ready. And, and they are aware that such a patient is there in the ER. And uh, once the imaging is done, we come into the picture. Our time is quite stringent. Triage time is about five minutes. Pre-CTA phase is about 15 minutes. CT angio, uh, CT time is about 15 minutes. And post-CTA, if you are moving to the cath lab, is about 20 minutes. In about 60 to 70% of the time, we achieve this time target. A good number uh, uh, as far as the Indian standards are concerned. There are situations where the patient takes time to make a decision because most of the uh, thrombectomies are done after the patient is able to pay. You know, affordability is an issue in this part of the world. And the patient has to make that decision. And that is what delays um, in, 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 go, uh, in about 40% of the cases. Uh, we strive to improve by constant uh, 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 revisiting the errors in the system and delays. So we have a stroke coordinator who, who gives us an input on wh where the delay has happened in each of the case. And uh, uh, we have a monthly meeting and uh, we also conduct public awareness and we collaborate with emergency medical services. Going forward, we work towards developing a telestroke unit 
and which is which is happening we have a, a connected command center from which we organize the telescope units to to smaller hospitals uh, and and nursing homes which which will have this kind of a video to uh, discuss about the stroke case and if a case for thrombectomy we would directly be ready to receive in the er and subsequently in the cath lab so CT ambulances are popular in some part. We don't have one, but uh, maybe uh, it might add value to the uh, service, but, but it's uh, not practical in good part of the world. So uh, within the system, uh, changing the scenario is quite easy, but uh, the, the pre-hospital care is what uh, bothers us, in, in, especially in a situation where uh, we practice the patient education is not so great. The pre-hospital emergency services are not as robust as we had in the U.S. Uh, in the U.S., the pre-hospital EMS is quite effective. The ambulance services 911 is quite effective. Uh, but in India, we don't have an effective ambulance service, but they are getting there. The ambulance services are improving and the emergency physician awareness are improving. But within the hospital, we have been really improved the system on par with any of the Western standards and, and we are able to offer treatment in a quick time. So to conclude, we all know that for acute ischemic stroke, time is brain and stroke is treatable for up to 24 hours. Uh, in the first four and a half hours, we give TPA and up to 24 hours, we can do mechanical thrombectomy. Beyond six hours, we select cases based on advanced imaging. And um, more and more acute ischemic strokes are being treated by mechanical thrombectomy. Even the vessel occlusion is not truly a large vessel, but a medium vessel and the small vessel occlusions are being treated and even low aspect scores are being treated uh, with mechanical thrombectomy. The evidence-based indications are expanding, the devices, the knowledge and the outcomes are improving. I thank you all for the patient listening. I'll be ready to take questions. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Professor Paramasubam. Uh, thank you very much uh, for a wonderful lecture. Uh, we could learn history of evolution of endovascular treatment and the evolution of device technology enabled to treat more distal vessels uh, to distal MCA, ACA, uh, very safely. And uh, furthermore, we could know of future direction of this uh, treatment. Okay. Uh, we have uh, some questions from uh, chat. Uh, the first question is, do you take uh, the patient for endovascular suit, uh, endovascular suit for thrombectomy immediately even he come, he come in 4.5 hours window? Correct. We do take them there, uh, right after uh, thrombolysis. Uh, we get the cath lab ready. Even as the thrombolysis is happening, we get the cath lab ready. We take the patient to the cath lab mm -hmm. and we assess the patient clinically. If the patient has improved, we would not do the procedure. We would come out. If the patient is not clinically improved, we would go ahead and do the procedure. As far as the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, um, the recommendations of, um, uh, I mean, uh, the North American uh, strokes uh, services, uh, as you can see here, I mean, we can't wait. I mean, it's it's uh, lethal to wait and we need to act immediately. So we always give the benefit of mechanical thrombectomy, but we would do thrombolysis because various studies have shown that thrombolysis followed by mechanical thrombectomy is more effective than direct uh, thrombectomy. So whenever possible, we do thrombolysis and we take the patient to thrombectomy, even if the patient comes earlier. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I agree with you. <laughs> okay, next question is, uh, do you use perfusion CBP, CVF, or MRI perfusion or diffusion studies? Yeah, I personally prefer to use a CT perfusion, uh, looking at the uh, uh, blood flow and the blood volume. Uh, but uh, we have, we operate strokes in about, uh, we have about six emergency rooms covering stroke for us. And we have three centers where we do actual mechanical thrombectomy as a team. And there are centers where uh, we have uh, MRI machine readily available than the CT machine. So in such centers, we have developed a MRI based protocol in, in where the CT is readily available, we have used a CT perfusion-based protocol. So irrespective of the protocol, all you need is the right information. 
And uh, based on the local availability of the machines and local availability of the technicians, because the CT perfusion needs a lot more technical person to reconstitute the image and to give you the input with regards to reformatting and uh, uh, doing calibrations. Unless otherwise you have a rapid software, which gives you automatically. If you don't have a rapid software, you need a skilled technician who may not be readily be available in the middle of the night. So given all these factors based on the situation, we have devised a system where we would get quick information uh, and, and uh, we would move forward. We would use either. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. There was a, there is one another strange question that has popped up. Probably you may answer that. Uh, some neurosurgeon from Nepal, he wants to proceed his career as a hybrid vascular neurosurgery and he's asking how long a complete training would last to gain confidence in doing procedures and taking decisions individually. Yeah, most of the training programs across the globe are offered for two years. If somebody has a basic angiographic experience, see most of the people today are getting trained in doing angiograms and the basic uh, uh, techniques of endovascular are taught during the residency period itself. If they have the basic training, they need an additional year of training. If they do not have the basic training, I would suggest two years of training, the first year to learn the basic skills, the second year to learn the advanced skills, and two years is kind of a standardized training for endovascular treatment, apart from the uh, surgical uh, clipping training that they've had for years. And the learning curve for endovascular treatment, unlike uh, our clipping and microsurgical dissections, is quite steep. If they, uh, they can learn it quite quick and fast, and um, two years is what I would suggest for him to undergo a training to, to be more confident and be efficient. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful discussion. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I have one question. Please, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry, very sorry. Uh, I think uh, uh, I have one question. How do you think of proper use uh, of stent retriever and uh, direct aspiration technique? Uh, I think I think stent retriever is very easy to deliver to the lesion. Uh, so it is good for a beginner. Uh, but uh, in the case of thrombus, it's very hard, uh, such as fibrin-rich clot. Uh, in such a case, uh, stent retriever uh, tends to fail to catch the thrombus. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, direct aspiration is also useful for hard thrombus if the aspiration catheter can engage into the thrombus, into thrombus. But sometimes, uh, this uh, catheterization or uh, aspiration catheter is difficult in tortuous vessel. In such a situation, stent, uh, uh, so, or I, I want, uh, I ask, I'd like to ask you, uh, which is, uh, do you like? <laughs> yeah. or what is the proper use? Yeah. As, as a, um, as an operator, I would like to go with the direct aspiration first. And if aspiration fails, to combine with the strength river with the aspiration, combine together as a salambra technique. As an operator, that's what I like. But we get some additional information from the initial CT scan or the MR image that we do. If it is an RBC, RBC rich clot, mm -hmm. you know that the, uh, I mean, uh, you have a hypertense MCA sign and if it is longer, then I would just go with the salambra technique upfront, have an mm -hmm. aspiration catheter and a strength river so that Com my combined technique. Go, correct. So that mm -hmm. my chances of distal emboli is extremely less. So I get some input from the initial CT scan and then try to make my decisions on using the device. Mm -hmm. If it is a fibrin rich clot, if no hypertense MCA is sign is seen, I would love to just go with an aspiration catheter and try to pull the clot out. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. I prefer to use combined technique uh, for uh, fibrin rich uh, clot as because. Uh, do you know, uh, stent anchoring technique. Uh, if we deploy stent uh, with river in this vessel and now uh, advanced catheter along with the wire, it's very useful, but uh, it has an uh, economic problem. Yeah, correct. <laughs> I agree. We, Thank we, you very much. We have a raised hand from uh, Joe. Yes, Joe. Thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Paramahisam. That was an excellent uh, lecture. Uh, I would like to ask uh, your opinion regarding uh, 
open surgical embolectomy after failed uh, mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, do, do you have experience in that? Do you think it is advisable? Uh, people are suggesting it may be the third line uh, after the 10 to 20% failure rate for uh, mechanical thrombectomy. Thank you. Uh, Joe, uh, that's a great question. And uh, I don't have a first-hand uh, experience with, with uh, uh, open surgical thrombectomy for acute ischemic stroke. Um, but I think if with endovascular treatment, if you're not able to remove the clot and the vessel is repeatedly shutting down, the chances that you have a primary atherosclerotic disease and the chances that the endothelium is already damaged and the vessel is shutting down again and again. In such situations, doing an open thrombectomy may not suffice because the vessel may not be a healthy vessel and the chances that, again, that would fail is significantly higher. So I'm not very optimistic about this approach. Uh, maybe people with experience can tell us more. Well, I can answer that question to Joe is that last week it was published, I think, and I'm not sure, but Jerry Fiedler from Czech Republic published his findings on microsurgical embolectomy or bypass for failed revascularization. And for your benefit, I'd like to mention that on the 24th of June, Jerry Fiedler him, himself is presenting this trial on the ACNS webinars. You're most welcome to join, you will learn this. So, oh, great, great. I read the paper. Okay, okay, okay great. Right. So, uh, we'll wind this up and we'll take the final remarks from our Honorable Chair, Vataru Surata. Mm. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd personally like to say thanks to uh, Paramasibam, uh, Professor Paramasibam, for providing great lecture. Uh, uh, maybe uh, this lecture is very useful for all young doctors uh, in and Asian people in the world. Uh, thank you. Uh, this session is now closed. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I would like to close this officially on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yofukato. I would like to thank both the speakers of today, Professor Hitoshi Fukuda and Dr. Srinivasan Paramasivan, as well as the chairs, Professor Mohsin Nuri, as well and Professor Vatara Surata for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. And I, as I mentioned earlier, there are around 560 people who have logged in through different channels. So, and also a special thanks to my co-host Lubun Singh for joining me today. So until we all meet online tomorrow, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.